the electric chair. 2D. Hello and welcome to the Electric Tear 2D. My name is Midnight Corey. Thank you again for watching. Uh, it's been really fun making the show so far, and you should also be listening to the audio show, um, which uh, comes out every Sunday and I have a lot of fun with. Now, the actress that I talk with on this episode, Sandra DaCosta, you heard that audio version on the audio podcast here a few episodes ago. So, um, this brings a whole new element to it. You get to actually see the interview, and she's a very nice looking actress and uh, really, really fun to talk to. Very cool. So uh, that'll be coming up. But before I get to that, of course, I have some goodness for you. I just finished up a couple books that came out. Uh, my friends at St. Martin's Press sent me a couple books. One's a novel, and the other is a short story kind of novella anthology book. Um, so the first one, this is Harbor by uh, Jean Avita Lundquist. Lindquist. Lindquist. I don't know. He's Swedish. I can't pronounce his name. But uh, he just put out Harbor. Now, this is the guy who uh, wrote uh, Let the Right One In. Um, and then before that there was a book called Handling the Undead, and now this is his third novel called Harbor. Um, it's actually really, really cool. Um, it's about this island. Uh, he made it up. Uh, there are some really weird things going on with people disappearing and reappearing and some coming back from the dead kind of stuff. And it's really, really cool. He's a very atmospheric writer. Uh, I've never read Let the Right One In, although I watched the movie and I loved it. Um, and I haven't read his Handling the Undead book, which sounds really interesting. Um, been some really great things said about that. So um, now I'm really, really interested in this guy because I really, really like Tarber. Um, it's atmospheric. There's a lot of backstory. Um, and people are calling him the uh, Swedish Stephen King, which I'm not sure I agree with. But uh, he is a fantastic writer. I love how he uses language everything to create this dread, this atmosphere, and uh, if you're into that kind of stuff, then Harbor is definitely the way to go. Now, next up, um, we have a horror anthology. It's brand new, and, you know, there are a million horror anthologies coming out anymore. Uh, there are a dime a dozen, and most of them just aren't that great. This is a book that promised to bring uh, the horror back to the horror anthology, and that is a book of horrors edited by Stephen Jones. Now, if you know Stephen Jones at all, he is a very, very well-respected uh, horror editor. He's done Lovecraft, a whole, a whole a lot of uh, different themed anthology books. So uh, he's really good at what he does. And he shows that in this book. I, I'm, this is a really, really solid anthology. Um, now, most notably, you're going to see Stephen King has a short story in here. But uh, I, didn't, I just didn't think it was that great. And I don't know what it is about Stephen King. I just I have a much harder time consistently getting into his newer stuff as opposed to his older stuff. So... Uh, his wasn't that great, but there are other authors in here, Ramsey Campbell, Caitlin Kiernan, who are really fantastic. I've actually really gotten into Caitlin Kiernan after seeing her uh, speak in a, a Lovecraft documentary here a few years ago, and I uh, really liked what she had to say, and I looked up some of her books and read a little bit about her, and uh, I, I'm really into her. She has a great story in here, Campbell does as well. Uh, we also have uh, Lindquist, you know, uh, he, he's in here. Um, his story's pretty good, again, atmospheric kind of thing. Uh, Michael Marshall Smith, Richard Christian Matheson, Lisa Tuttle, and many more. Uh, I'm just reading that off the book. But uh, I'll tell you what, I really enjoyed it. It's really solid. I didn't like everything in here, but uh, for the most part, I really enjoyed it. There wasn't, you know, this uh, Stephen Jones, the editor, he is all, all up in arms about how now it's uh, all horror it seems to be turning towards uh, paranormal romance, sort of, and then, you know, the Twilight kind of thing. So he's dead set on really delivering some some good visceral horror here and I think he does a great job so once again book of horrors edited by Stephen Jones I recommend thank you again St. Martin's and um, that's what I got for you let's uh, watch my interview with Sandra DaCosta <laughs> Well, I welcome to the show tonight indie actress Sandra DaCosta Sandra thank you for joining me tonight Oh, thanks, Corey. Oh, it's it's really cool. Actually, you know, we just kind of um, started talking on Twitter a little bit, and I started looking at the stuff you did, and, you know, you're, some of the stuff you're saying was pretty cool. And so I'm like, wow, hey, you want to be on the show? You know, I'd like to talk with you and get to know about the kind of stuff that you do. So uh, it's really cool. We just kind of happened to kind of hook up on Twitter. So Yeah, I know. It's funny how that happens. I think I've actually had a few offers through Twitter, and it's nice. it's really great to kind of connect with people that way. Yeah. Because you, you'll never actually get to meet them face-to-face, -face, and then lo and behold, 
I mean, you're pretty much almost right in front of me. So yeah, yeah, this is really cool. So I, I appreciate you taking your time here on the weekend to hang out a little oh, bit. Oh, it's no worries, no problem. S Sundays are like my my day off, my my down day. Oh, hey, all right. It's Cool, cool. So uh, you're in Toronto. Uh, we were talking a little bit uh, before the show, and uh, you seem to do most of your work, uh, your acting work and everything uh, in the Toronto area. I know you've moved around a little bit, but uh, what is it about uh, Toronto that's kind of keeping you there? As far as the scene goes, what's going on? Um, well, I'd have to say that it's the indie scene, um, the non-union indie scene, I would say. Hmm. Um I don't know. In my opinion, I feel like it's come a long way from when I started acting like five, six years ago. Um, and I just there's a lot of there's a lot of films being made in Toronto and in the surrounding area as well. But um, right now, I don't see any reason to venture out to New York or L.A. at the moment. Because I'm busy, my schedule's busy, so um, awesome. Toronto's, where, Toronto's where it's at right now. Yeah, well, that's I'm glad to hear that you're busy. That's uh, yeah. that's really great. And uh, just looking at uh, your website and your IMDb and the kind of stuff you do, like you you seem like you're pretty pretty busy. And yeah. uh, so, um, how did you start? Where did you kind of get your interest in acting? Um, you know what? It's just it was always one of those kind of unspoken desires that I had. Um, and I mean, in all honesty, it really kind of just stemmed from my childhood and just just being a kid and having this imagination and just always wanting to be in that kind of place because real life kind of sucks a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I just um, kind of jumped in with both feet. There's no rhyme or reason really to it other than this compelling uh, desire that I had to to want to be involved in film awesome so it's a yeah, very so natural I, thing for you yeah even though when you talk about it with people it seems like the most unnatural thing to <laughs> do um, but for the most people I would say for the most part people think it's pretty cool once you start talking about what you're doing and what you did on set and you know like you're jumping from one boat to the next and you're trying to get the shot and everybody just thinks it's really cool so it is I don't know I'm happy to be a part of it it is really cool. Like, what's the what's the craziest thing that's happened to you on set? Like something just completely out of there. Maybe something that they asked you to do, and you're like, "What? I gotta I gotta do that to to make this scene no, work?" Or no, you know what? I I like that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's the one thing that I kind of put out into the universe over the last couple of months is that I wanted to do um, projects that were much more action oriented and right. much more physical, um, and usually those kind of projects kind of um, require a bit of a bigger budget to have those kind of shots involved. But luckily I've been involved, like I just wrapped on a, a project that was all shot out on the water between two boats. Um, and that was just, that was awesome because I've never done that before. I can check that off my list of like things to do. Um, nice. And hopefully I'd like to revisit it and do it again. But um, in terms of like anything that I've come across in my projects that um, I've been afraid of, that hasn't really that really hasn't really arised. I don't think. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty. I, like I don't know. I just anything that kind of I don't want to say throw caution to the wind because you know I don't want to hurt myself or anything. Yeah. But just it's nice to do something that's outside of the box that I wouldn't do in my normal everyday life. Oh, cool. Oh, so yeah. you're willing to take a few risks and willing to I am. have some fun. I am. You know what? I love Tom Cruise because, I, like, you know, whatever his Scientology or any of your, you know, your opinions with regards to that, it doesn't matter. But in terms of an actor, um, I respect him wholeheartedly because that man gives, like, 120% oh, yeah. uh, when he's involved in a project. And, I mean, he's doing his own stunts. And, I don't know, I just think there's something really great about doing that. Yeah. 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 Oh, cool. Cool. I'm glad to hear that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you've done uh, actually some really interesting work. You know, I, again, I was looking at the, the kind of films that you've done and, uh, you know, you've done some music videos and some shorts and some features and there's uh, all yeah. kinds of stuff that is kind of in progress right now and is coming yeah. up even. But uh, in, in particular, there, there are a few things that really interested me and uh, I'm going to kind of ask you about them. Uh, first of all, uh, The Devil Walks Among You. Mm -hmm. um, that seems like a really, really cool short. The things I'm reading about it, um, a lot of people are interested in it. 
Um, and it's it's almost got what like a kind of an EC comic sort of feel to it. Um, yeah. Yeah. You what's know, that all about? It's um, it's well, Ryan M. Andrews, who I'm not sure if you looked up, but he mm -hmm. has did um, the feature film Black Eve. And I just wrapped a feature with him last year called Sick, but maybe we can get to that later. Oh, I was going to um, ask you about that, too. <laughs> okay, cool. I, I will wait for you to, to ask about that. Uh, we wrapped on Sick, but I first met Ryan on um, his project, The Devil Walks Among You. And his take on it was that he wanted to revisit um, horror films of the past. And not so much it being about the in-your-face blood and gore, but just in the storytelling and the way that the events unfold. And um, uh, just more of um, a Tales from the Crypt kind of storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I would be the Crypt Keeper. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's got a little bit of a film noir feel to it. And... Um, it's just kind of like you don't really quite see how things are unfolding until the very end, and then you kind of get slapped in the face. I love it's it. like, oh, that's what was happening. Awesome. So yeah, yeah, it's it's a great project, and luckily um, I've had got the chance to work with Ryan again on um, Sick, yeah. which is a feature film. Yeah. Yeah. So what's Sick all about? I I was reading about it, and it actually particularly interested me because um, it sounded you know kind of apocalyptic. You know, there was an outbreak going on, and I'm I'm a big like zombie and infected. Uh, movie yeah. fan. So this seems kind of right up my alley. Okay, well, cool. Um, it is precisely that, um, but with the story um, revolving around the the human condition um, and what a person will do in, under those circumstances um, to survive. And I think that's what makes a good story, like a horror, horror oh, film. Oh, it's, yeah. oh, yeah. it's always about like the people who are it, stuck in that situation and have to figure out a way to survive like from one day to the next. And I mean, the majority of the time is not the battle between them and the zombies, but between each other. Yeah. Um, so that's very much what it is. It's um, set two years um, after this um, uh, outbreak has happened, and you follow a group of survivalists. Um, everyone has their own intentions and motives, mm -hmm. which are not entirely clear in the beginning but work their way through the film. Um, and this was the, actually, you know what, this is, this kind of got what got me started on the whole action kick. Uh, it was, um, I, I got some gun and handling training. Um, and my character, Betsy, that I play, she's a, she's an Uzi toting survivalist. Awesome. So I got to fire off a couple of rounds of that sucker, which was awesome. Oh, awesome. that sounds like fun. Yeah, because I, I was looking on your website and you have pictures posted and everything of you just <laughs> you know, firing guns. A lot of people with a lot of guns actually uh, seem to have been on set. Yeah, Every, everyone carries a different uh, weapon. Awesome. Whether it's knives or just semi automatics, uh, shotguns, a little bit of everything. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. how was it? I mean, was that the first time you fired fired a gun or. Absolutely. Oh, yeah? yeah. How was that yeah. experience for you? It was awesome. I yeah. um I'm looking forward to doing it again. I um I don't know. I could just we we just went out to um we just went out and spent the day learning how to to use firearms and how to handle them obviously with safety. But um I mean, when I was done with my training with the Uzi, um I just didn't sit around and like twiddle my thumbs. I would go on with the next actor who had like the shotgun so yeah. I could learn a little bit about that. And then I would go on to the other actor who had two semi-automatics and I would learn a little bit about that. So it just everything in general about it, it really interested me. And I would love the opportunity to handle firearms again in another film. <laughs> oh, awesome. And I'm sure you will if you're going the action route. I mean, that's that just comes with the territory, I think. So I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. Oh, that's a lot of fun. So I can't, I can't wait actually uh, to see Sick. Do you know what the, um, kind of what the status is right now? Or uh, it's, I believe they are looking for a fall, twenty twelve release. Um, yeah, I just heard back from the director, and he says that it looks great and it's been color corrected. So I believe it will not be that long before we get to see it on the big screen, which I'm really excited. Oh, that'll yeah. be great. That'll be great. I can't yeah. wait, and uh, you know. 
I hope maybe uh, once it comes out, you know, I'll be able to take a look and review it and let you know what yeah, I think. Yeah, you know what? If if oh, I hope that it it makes some. Um, I hope that it gets screened in a few theaters. Yeah, because that's. I'd say that in the last two years of with um, some of the work, that's probably been like the greatest benefit, is knowing that when these films are completed, that there's actually something that's going to be done with them afterwards. Yeah. Um, so it's it's. <laughs> It's great to see them on the screen, and it's an entirely different experience to have people who are not part of the filming process mm. watch the film. Yeah, it's a completely different experience, and definitely not lost on me. So I don't take it for granted. Yeah, oh, that's cool. And you know, as a, as a film viewer, in which I, I know you know, I mean, there's just some sort of magic there. You know, seeing this picture forty feet wide in front of you, you know, with all the the sound system, and just uh, there's yeah. something about it that magical yeah. quality. And, uh... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's just, you know, um, the cinema experience has changed a lot um, from when I was growing up in the 80s. Mm. Um, in the 80s, you would have like maybe four films would be being screened in the theater and they would be in the theater for like three months. Right. And now we've got movies constantly coming out and being generated. And I think I think some good stuff gets lost in the shuffle. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. But um, you know what? You never know what you're going to find. So just go out to the theaters and watch movies. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, and I, I really dig, too, the fact that uh, you're doing a lot of indie stuff. Um, because to me, the, the indie film industry, the things that are being produced by independents, is a, a, a gold mine right now. I mean, yeah. I think you'll find some of your best stuff. You know, they, you know, every once in a while, Hollywood can, you know, come out with something decent and worth watching, but uh, mm -hmm. it's mainly the indies for me. Yeah, well, you know what? I think that there's a bit more creative integrity that gets to be kept through the indie process as opposed to big studio films. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, studios, that they're so huge now. They, they need to make that money back they have to so they have to try to figure a way to make a movie not just based off of content but who they can sell it to and so i mean that's changed the game so much right yeah. um long gone are the days that you there would be films that were rated r mm. you don't see a lot of them in the theater anymore because everything is kind of geared to, to to pick up on a little bit of every demographic that's out there yeah so that's why there's a lot of pg and pg-13 films right so I think with indie, you get to create, keep that into that creative integrity yeah. more so than you would with studio films. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, speaking of creativity, uh, the one other film of yours that uh, I kind of wanted to uh, talk with you about a little bit was Stealing Home. Oh, um, yeah. That one seems super, <laughs> you know, just a, a lot is going into this. And I love, you know, the whole UFO kind of thing going on and this whole gang thing. You know, I read a little bit about it, but could you tell me what's going on with Stealing Home? I will do my best to <laughs> going on with Stealing Home. Um, Stealing Home is a film, a short film set in, um, I guess, like the 1960s. The, yeah, the 1960s in, in somewhere kind of New Yorkish, Brooklyn. Um, there's some stereotypes that we play up with, but I think we play up with them well. Um, I mean, we got to have these vintage vehicles on set, Mustangs, um, these great costumes. And the script was very kind of tongue-in-cheek. And I don't know, it was a lot of fun. I was actually just reminiscing the other day. It's funny because I don't necessarily take home characters with me at the end of the day. But mm -hmm. Cheeks, my character Cheeks that I play in Stealing Home, I think she's probably one of the characters that I, I reminisce the most about. Mm -hmm. And that I kind of miss her a little bit because <laughs> she was sassy and she, I don't know, she was sassy and she knew how to, I don't know, she just, she could hold her own. And she's the only female character out of that whole cast. Everyone else were, they were all guys. Um, and so <sighs> Stealing Home plays a little bit with the whole um, kind of like landed immigrants coming to the States and prospering. Mm. And you have this, this storyline of this timeline of like an alien landing, like on the planet earth mm. and just those two stories kind of correlating with each other. So it's a little bit of like 
politics a little bit with a little bit of like this nice story to kind of go back to so it's just not in your face and it's entertaining um and yeah there's an alien in it and i don't know it's just a great film to watch it's just a great little short film i like i was hoping that they would make um a feature out of it mm. but i don't think that's the case but that's okay oh. stealing is a fine project to be on i'm very proud of it yeah yeah and it seems like all these were really well received when they were screened you know different festivals and different things yeah. like that and, uh... yeah well C- Cannes uh was its first um festival so awesome that kind of got all of us cheering for it, yeah. which was amazing because it happened shortly after we wrapped. Wow. So it was awesome. Now, did you actually go to Cannes or did no. you? Oh. No, I, didn't. I was actually, um, that was a, that was a busy year for me. I was shooting, um, and it just was impossible for me to get out there, yeah. but the director and the screenwriter made it out there. So yeah. Yeah, they had a good experience while they were there. Oh, I'm sure that would be it's so cool to get out there some year to just Yeah, I, you that. know what? It's going to happen. I'll go for sure. It'll yeah. happen. Oh, I hope so. I, have to have, I just have to have some downtime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. So what are you, what are you working on now? I'm, I'm currently, uh, anything you can tell me that's kind of coming up or just about to come out or you're doing right now? I can tell you a little bit of both of those things. Sweet. Um, I just wrapped on um, a web series called Pete Winning and the Pirates. Um, It's a swashbuckling adventure. Um, There's pirates and laser guns. Um, You've got all walks of life involved in this web series. Um, uh, It was created uh, and directed by Mike Donis, um, who lives here in Toronto. Uh, He he actually got the idea with... um, the co-creator Jason um, Jason Lever, who they they were creating this action sequence for this um, competition, and they were saying, "Well, we can film it on a boat, and well, why don't we just have lasers in it too? And <laughs> hey, they can be pirates because we're on the water." Oh, and, wow. and I guess the action sequence just came out so well, and. It was just more than they expected, the finished product, that they figured it had some legs to stand on. So they went on to raise almost $12,000, oh, wow. which is unbelievable for a web series yeah. in its first season. Actually, only a pilot. So it's pretty incredible that there was that much support behind it. Yeah. So there's definitely legs for this web series. Um, awesome. Yeah, so um, the web series, it takes place in like... 2030, there's been this huge upheaval and this huge war. Um, mankind's ways with regards to gas consumption, like fossil fuels and all this stuff comes back around to bite us in the ass. Uh, there's a flooding, like a global warming, flooding, radiation of all kinds, and you're left with sea dwellers. Mm. Um, seems to be the way that you have to travel and get back and forth. Um and I, my character is um, my character is named Jane, and she is a, a tax collector for the queen, who pretty much runs everything. So anyone who wants to dock anywhere has to pay a tariff. Mm-hmm. Um, and in my journeys and the people I get to meet when they come and dock, I meet the lead character whose name is Pete Winning, um, and he's very charismatic and has a way with his words and. Very kind of, the series is kind of a little, it's tongue in cheek for sure. Mm. Tongue in cheek and um, throw any kind of pirate lines in there that you can. We've got them. Awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's going to be a really great series. Um, and my character Jane meets Pete Winning and um, he makes her an offer that she can't refuse because quite frankly working for the Queen isn't really getting her anywhere. Mm. It's just getting her day by day in her life. And she realized that there's a greater purpose to her being. So mm. off she goes with Pete winning and we'll see what happens. <laughs> awesome. Oh, I, I love the sound of, I mean, pirates, lasers, you're at sea. I mean, I'm, I'm all for yeah, it. So we, I can't we wait. Shot, we shot the whole thing. We were on the water for, I think it was four or five days. Um, I have some really bad tan lines to <laughs> it from my outfit. Um, <laughs> But you know, it's my first time being out at sea shooting anything, and I realized after the first day that I know nothing about 
see terminology, the jargon, oh. the, the hall, <laughs> the stern. I don't know any of that stuff. It was just like right over my head. I realized we really got to learn more about this stuff if I want to be on this web series. Uh. <laughs> so, um, no, it was really great. And you know what's great, too, is that the people that we were shooting on the harbor with, they were so happy to hear that we were doing something, and they were so helpful. I mean, they're like, what are you shooting? Can we help? Can our boats be in it? Like, these people are excited. Like, cool. you know, I'm surprised nobody called the cops on us, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, that's, that's actually awesome. how it is. You have the nosy neighbor who's like, what are you doing? And, yeah. you know, next thing you know, the cops are coming. And, I mean, <laughs> mind you, we're on the water, so it could have been a high-speed chase for all I know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was a really great experience. It was really good. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to uh, work with those guys. Awesome. Sounds yeah. exciting. Do you know when that's uh, that's supposed to start up? Um, we have one big finale scene to shoot um, in September. It's a very big action scene. Um, a lot of laser shootouts and stuff. All right. So, but I think, I don't know, I'm going to say, well, those guys are pretty eager to get it going. And I think they've already looked at all the footage that we shot so far. Hmm. They're really happy with it. And... Um, I don't know. I want to say the end of this year, but I could be very wrong. Yeah. It could be early next year. I have no idea. Since we just wrapped, it's it's really even kind of yeah soon. But I will come back and tell you for sure when I, I hope know. So. I hope so. <laughs> That's another one. Yeah, you got so many great things going on here. I just uh, man, I hope we keep in touch and just you, you keep me updated on kind of how I can oh, see I, things. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, if you don't mind me knocking down your door, please do. Please do. Oh. It's oh, awesome. absolutely. So. <laughs> Oh, cool. Anything else uh, you got going on that you can tell me about or any um, any upcoming I of, excitement? I've, I can kind of skim over a few projects. Some of them are kind of top secret. Yeah, I hate when, yeah that's just a thing. I hate when they do that because it's so hard. Like you're yeah. so happy as an actor to be working and you have these projects in the very near distant future. And it's just like, oh, man, I can't talk <laughs> about it in detail. But I'll tell you what I can. Um, the first project that I'm really excited to get started on um, is, a, is a action adventure TV pilot, mm -hmm. which is also being, um, I think, optioned as a feature. Um, this is what I call my Indiana Jones role. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm really excited about it because um, I put that out in the universe, too, that I wanted to do um, like an Indiana Jones or a James Bond kind of role. All right. Um, so, yeah, so I've been um, in the process of training, which is good that we're not shooting yet because I still get some more time to get my physique in order. <laughs> so I look like I'm a relic hunter and that I've been out and about in the desert and climbing rocks and cliffs and, and jumping into big quarries and all this stuff that's going to happen. So this is very much an action-oriented role, so I'm really happy about that. Um, the pilot, I believe, is going to take about 20 days to shoot. Um, so it's very intense um, because that's just the first episode. Yeah. yeah. So um, but I'm really excited about that. And um, I have a horror short that nice. we shot the teaser for um, just about a month ago. But unfortunately, I can't talk too much about that. So I feel kind of silly even bringing it up. Uh, but Hey, it's, it's horror. I like the sounds of that. It's, so that's, it's, that's all right. It's going to be a really great collaboration with, a group of people <laughs> um, <laughs> that are very well known um, within the Toronto indie scene um, in terms of the directors. Um, yeah. And then I have two features coming up, another a horror feature. Cool. And, um, and the other one is a spy thriller, awesome. which is awesome. I don't think there's enough spy thrillers out there in the theaters. Yeah. I think so I'm I'm excited about all these projects because they're all exactly what I've been asking for, what I've been craving for. So that's it's great. Perfect. That yeah. is really great, and it, it, it's it's really cool too that you're diversifying, you know, and you're not just going straight horror, straight action, straight thriller, no. you know, anything like that. Um, yeah, you, know, you like no. to spread out a little bit, you know. I I I haven't seen you do like uh, have you done like a romantic comedy kind of thing, or don't you want to go there? Um, you know what I I do I just um. I have not found, and it hasn't found me this mm. this perfect ideal script. Because yeah. I think I think 
like comedies, I would definitely like to do more of. I've mm. done like maybe two um, that haven't really gone anywhere, but were good experiences. But they haven't um, gone anywhere. But I just I think comedy is is really tricky. Yeah. Um, because I'm not really, I I don't really like slapstick comedy. Yeah, and it's got to be smart. Um, smart comedy. Yeah. And it's hard to find a good script that's written like that. Yeah. Um, the opportunity hasn't presented itself yet. Yeah. Um, romantic comedies, they're tough too because I feel like they, the way they are going now, they can't decide what they are. Mm. Yeah. Uh, like there's, there's no clear point or direction that they're going in. Um, and again, I don't know if that's just what we want to try to get as much audience as we can yeah. cover. Um, but those are definitely things that I want to do because I don't want to pigeonhole myself. Like, yeah. you know, it's, it's great to focus and say, well, if you're good at this and people know you for doing horrors and just keep doing that because you're good at it and people see you in that and that's what they remember you for. But quite frankly, I, that's just not me. I just want to do all of it and I yeah. don't see why. Well, and, and the more that you do, it kind of stretches the boundaries of your experience and uh, your skill set and everything. It, yeah. I, I think it benefits everything that you do. So even if you do something like a romantic comedy, uh, something like that, it, in some way it's going to benefit your action films and your horror films and things like that. I think everything just kind of kind of benefits yeah. uh, you, you as an actor uh, as a whole. So Well, they're all opportunities to get yourself out there. Right. So. Um... I don't know why, I mean, I don't know why I wouldn't yeah. if the opportunity presented itself. As long as it's a script that I like and, and, you know, I think that I would enjoy being part of the project, then that's cool. Yeah. Bring it on. Now, have you ever considered uh, maybe uh, doing something outside of the acting arena but still in film? Maybe just, uh, you know, any kind of maybe writing or directing or uh, you have mm -hmm. ambitions to do that kind of thing? Or do you like, do you like the whole acting gig? No, I don't want to do anything else. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> so you prefer that side of the camera. You want to be in front of the camera and not, not behind it then. I don't want to be behind it, no. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you have the look. You're, you're very easy on the eyes. So I oh. think that's a very wise decision. <laughs> uh, so. Thank you. But you know what? Like, honestly, like, I mean, in all case in point, like, it's nice to know that if there's some talent backing it up, that there'll be longevity in this career. Yeah. yeah. So, you know what? Yeah. But you know what? You have to see some of my films, so then you can tell me whether or not that's the case. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I hope to do that here real soon. And uh, I hope so, too. And you know what? If if I can get you a copy of something, I will do that. I would really appreciate that. Okay. That'd be very cool. Yeah. So, awesome. Sweet. Sweet. Well, um, as we were emailing back and forth, I'm like, hey, let's talk about a movie, you know, to kind of have some fun during the interview here. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you sent me a list of, uh, of movies and I picked the one out that uh, I actually I've been wanting to see for a long time. And finally, uh, you gave me an excuse to pull it out of my pile and, and give it a watch here. And I'm so thankful. But reading about you, and I, I also understand it happens to be one of your favorite films. Yeah. Um, in general, um, we're talking about Pan's Labyrinth. Mm -hmm. So why is this uh, your favorite? Or one of your favorites, anyhow? Oh, it's, it's one of my favorites. Um, I just... I think it just satisfies that adult imagination in me. Hmm. Um, when I initially saw the trailers for it, I mean, I definitely thought it was a dark and twisted fairy tale, but going into the theater and watching it, it was just a whole other experience that I just wasn't expecting. Mm -hmm. um, Del Toro is, just in terms of his visual storytelling, he's a genius I think in my in my opinion I, I don't know if that's why they've brought him on as a producer for the uh, Incredible Hulk that's supposed to come out mm -hmm. um, but I just this film I don't know it's just a sensory overload I mean the story that exists there that's there it's it's amazing it's just there's so many different layers to it and what you're gonna take away from it I mean there's there's the aspect of the um, like the the Spanish Civil War and um, and then you have this little girl whose life is in complete turmoil with her stepfather and her mother going through a pregnancy because she's she's being made to carry this pregnancy to term for the stepfather so that he can have a son to carry on the name and the legacy. Mm -hmm. um, and he's kind of a dictator in that sense, oh, in yeah. my opinion. Um, but just the fact that um, 
you know, I guess what's interesting, oh, this 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 <laughs> film when I talk about it, I just all these things start. Racing, so I have to try to like keep myself in check here. No, I understand. That's that's awesome. It's just um, it's it's awesome to see that she has to she has to take herself out of her situation through this this imaginary place that she's set up for herself. Um, and what's nice about Pan's Labyrinth is that it doesn't wrap itself up in a nice little tidy bow at the end. You said you've seen it or you uh, haven't? Oh, yeah, yeah. I finally okay. gave it a watch, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, and it's just, it's kind of, I guess what's sad is that her victory kind of pales in comparison to like, um, the failures of the adult world mm. and just that's to me that's how it doesn't wrap up in a nice little bow um, and I just I love that it was a little bit of there's like this little bit of like this dirty gritty horror story involved there oh, yeah. um, like definitely a nightmarish world um, mm. but and it's funny that that's what she would choose to disappear into so she wouldn't have to deal with her real life because her real life was an absolute nightmare. Mm -hmm. Like I can't even imagine the things that she was going through, living through that myself. And the fact that she was taking herself out of that and putting herself in this other world, in this labyrinth and meeting these mythical creatures who were so nightmarish in my opinion. Oh yeah. Just, just like what the balance there, like that that was an escape for her. Mm -hmm. And it was just as nightmarish as her real life. Like it's kind of like messed up to me when I think about it. Oh, yeah. But, um, just the storylines, just the overlapping storylines, how they, how they converged and then diverted away from each other. And the funny thing is, is I mean, people might think that Pan's Labyrinth is is like solely this um, this fairy tale land, but it's not because I'd say about like what, maybe seventy five percent of the film took place, like in in the real world in their right. present time, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they didn't I mean, overdo the whole fantasy mm -hmm. uh, make believe element of it. Yeah. No, and I, I they didn't use that like wholeheartedly to tell her story, which was, yeah. I thought was really good. And the other thing I really liked about it is that it was um a Spanish film and I've watched it. I mean, there was the English subtitles, but quite frankly, I never found myself reading the subtitles at the bottom of the screen because yeah. The acting is so compelling that I just felt I knew what was going on anyways. Yeah, yeah. And that, uh, it, it's, a, like you said, a very visual, visually rich film. Mm -hmm. um, just everything they did uh, looked fantastic, and it was so much fun to watch. And that was kind of, man, I, I had to rewatch so much of this, like kind of fast forward or rewind a little bit, because I would find myself completely ignoring the subtitles like you said because it's like especially yeah. when when pan is on the screen and when he, she's fighting some of these monsters and and uh and a lot of the the drama the chase scenes things like that i'm like yeah. i just realized i have no idea what's been said back and forth for like the last two minutes here because i've just been watching yeah. and so drawn into the visual aspect of it and yeah. so i had to go back and and you know, figure out what they're That's saying. Cause I don't know any Spanish. So, you know, <laughs> I know, I know a little bit of Spanish, but, mm -hmm. um, and just like you said, though, the visuals were part of the storytelling, but just, I think everything that was encompassed in that film aided in storytelling, which is why I didn't depend so much on the, the subtitles, the English subtitles. And, um, I don't know. I just thought that was a great film. And, in terms of films that I've seen in the theater that really stand out to me, that's definitely one of them. Yeah, you know, I, we we just got off talking about, you know, how, you know, Hollywood, you know, few and far between in the theaters, you know, it's kind of rough, the indie scenes where it is. But this is an example of like a big budget film that, yeah. uh, man, did it right uh, on, yeah. on all all counts. And uh, Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, they used a lot of animation, you know, a lot of CG and, and things. Um, how did you think that came off? Um, did it blend thought, well with the with the footage with the real footage? I thought it did. I yeah. thought it was pretty seamless. Um, yeah. And and I think that in as much of I think that they tried to create as much of that world as possible hmm. in like the physical. Yeah. And and in and in terms of I'm not saying that there wasn't a lot of CGI. Right. But. For that film, there was I'm sure there was tons of it. Yeah. But in terms of it being kind of minimal for that project, um, 
I think they definitely achieved it. Like, I, I thought it was pretty seamless. Yeah, me too. I, I was going into it expecting actually a, an enormous CGI world. You know, I was expecting a lot more, but uh, I mean, you're right. The vast majority of this is is real footage, um, yeah. and uh, they blended in. You know, a lot of the creatures. Um, I, I especially like how they did the character of Pan. How they did that uh, that one monster, that eye monster with the eyeballs on his hands, which I loved, yeah. and I kind of I yeah. think I'm gonna have nightmares about him. Um, yeah. But uh, that kind of thing. I think they used real actors and they augmented uh, a lot of it with. CGI, yep. which was brilliant, you know, especially Pan is as complex as he mm -hmm. was, you know, with the different, uh, you know, his ears and the way his eyes were and the horns and everything. I mean, just, uh, I think, an amazing feat visually there and effects wise where you knew you're like, there's no way they could pull this off in the real world. Not that this wasn't, you know, a built model or anything like that. But yeah, you yep. know, some of it's CGI, but you can't really figure out where one begins and the other one ends. You know, they, they did it so well. Yeah. And you know, you know, speaking of that character, Pan, he's, isn't he so creepy? Yeah. And he's the good guy, you know? And he's a good, good guy. Exactly. And that's the thing, though, is I could never tell until a certain point in the film which side he was playing uh, yeah. on. Yeah. And I like that they did that mm -hmm. with him because um, it just always kept me guessing. She kept going back to this guy and I'm like, this girl is nuts because mm -hmm. he's creepy and he's making her do these like weird things things and the other thing that i like too about that story though is that the tasks that he um the tasks that he put onto her they didn't feel really forced in terms yeah. of the storyline right. they just kind of grad grand gradually found their way back into her real life and it's like oh you have to do this now and yeah. here's the way you're going to do it and it's just like i don't know i just love that film oh yeah yeah and i love the third task, I mean, the way she finally proves herself at the end. And again, we won't spoil it, spoil it in case somebody oh. watching, you know, is, is, <laughs> hasn't seen it yet. But um, that just, man, at the end, it really gets you. I mean, just emotionally, it, it, it does wrap things together without, like you said, tying a pretty bow on it. Because there's, you take the good with the bad, you know, at, at the end of the film. And there are some things I didn't expect you know, I thought, you know, it was going to wrap up a certain way and it was going to have more of a fairy tale ending, you know, no, happily ever after everyone goes into the sunset and it's all good. And that's yeah, not the case. I think that was one of the things that I really liked about this film as well, is that they made a decision to be unapologetic yeah. about every choice that they made. So if they were ruthless, they were ruthless to the core. Yes. I mean, and the stepfather ruthless right until the oh, end you hated that guy oh man i, I, hate, <laughs> I love to hate him i yeah. love to hate him and that i think that every character managed to do that they were unapologetic in in their motives regardless of where they were coming from they just like full out made a choice and they stuck with it yeah. and i think that that's another great thing about his choice for casting like his oh, actors yeah. are amazing at that Every role, I think, was cast perfectly. You know, I love the role. You know, of course, the, the captain, uh, the mother, the um, uh, the woman that took care of the captain, who is kind of the, you know, working both sides. The go-between, between, yeah, between, yeah assistant soldiers. Yeah. yeah, along with the doctor and, and the, the rebel soldiers, you know, who are in the woods and, and the little girl. Um, there was no weak role. You know, no one, you know, was kind of iffy. You know, I, I thought everyone just fit the bill perfectly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. absolutely right i'm glad that you finally watched it oh me too me too i'm so <laughs> glad i actually bought it i'm like you know I, I i went on you know i'm a big streaming video guy anymore you know and it wasn't on netflix so i'm, I'm looking and i actually bought it now it's permanently on my like amazon streaming thing now so i'm gonna watch it okay. all the time and i'm gonna get my wife to watch it and i have a, I have a little boy and when he's old enough he's gonna watch it with me too and yeah i'm glad that when I, he's old enough I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, when he's old enough. That, that's just a thing. But this is, I mean, th there's so much in this movie, I think, for everyone. And, you know, some people are going to be like, you know, this, this is a horror podcast for all intents and purposes, you know. And, and so people are going to be like, eh, Pan's Labyrinth, that's not a horror film. You know, but um, it's almost unclassifiable. I guess I would call it like a like a fantasy horror kind of kind of thing i don't know but it, it yeah. has some horror elements in it some genuinely scary things like i said that eye monster oh my yeah. god that thing was horrific it was it was gruesome um, well i guess it, i guess it depends you know what horror comes in all shapes and sizes right, yeah, right. um 
Now, I mean, people want to see the stuff that's right in your face. And sometimes you do want to see it. And then sometimes it's overkill and you're like, okay, I've seen enough. I've mm-hmm. seen enough. Like, is there going to be some story that comes into this? That's just me. Mm-hmm. I want to see a little bit of both. I yeah. don't mind seeing the horror and the blood and the guts and like, you know, decapitating people and all this other stuff happening. But there just has to be some story. Otherwise, I want to turn it off. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And even looking at the story with the captain and uh, his his wife and the little girl, that whole dynamic, everything that's going on there, that's horrific what this little girl is living through. I mean, this is pure horror because she's she's deathly afraid of, of the captain and what he can do. She's witnessed what he's capable of doing. And yeah. uh, just for her to be stuck in this situation, you know, basically helpless, she's, you know, kind of trapped in this, this war-torn area. And uh, she has nowhere to go except basically inside of her own mind and in this, this world cool. she's created. So that's horror on kind of a different level. It's not blood and guts and it's, you know, nothing like that. But this girl is living in a state of horror. And uh, I think you communicate that it's more of a real world kind of situation. Yeah. It's definitely yeah, horror. absolutely. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. I love it. I don't know. Another movie that I love is um, Jaws, and yes. to me, Jaws is a different level. It's it's a drama, but it's a thriller, but it's kind of a little bit of horror for me. Absolutely. I mean, there's people who've never stepped foot in the water after watching that movie. I, so that's scared. I'll tell me, what is that? That's oh. that's scared, right? Like something has terrified you to the fact that you don't want to go back in the water. So that oh, could yeah. be considered. It's absolutely horror. I mean, the first time I watched that when I was a kid, it scared the <laughs> crap out of me. You know, I've I talked about this on another show how um, I watched it right before um, my family took me vacationing to the beach, which was awesome, you know, because then I didn't yeah, want to get in the water. That's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I just remember, man, just thinking, I mean, every time you're looking and, and seeing if you can see anything, any shapes floating around in the water, anything like that. And a movie that has that kind of effect on you, I mean, that's... That is definitely a horror film, but you're right. I mean, you don't always think of horror. You think, oh, you know, it was Night of the Living Dead or it was Halloween or Friday the 13th, you know, that that uh, really got to you. But, uh, no, Jaws is one of those ones that I don't think any, you know, a lot of people always uh, think of. But uh, Well, you know what? I, I appreciate, like, I don't know, because I grew up during the 80s, so I watched – you know, I watched some awesome horror flicks and what was considered like some really great storytelling. I mean, like you said, Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, yeah. you know, like, I mean, those are some classics. Hellraiser. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, yeah. the list can go on and on. Like some of the some of the stuff that's like the early 70s, too, is just awesome. Mm-hmm. And and I think that you kind of become de- well, you become desensitized when you keep seeing like all the saws that are out there, like, you know. Yeah. Like it, like Saw was its own detriment. Like I mean, the first mm-hmm. film was great. I liked the first film. Yeah. Second film, yeah. yeah, it was okay. And then from then on out, it was just like, well, now I've been desensitized to the film and what it's going mm-hmm. to show me. And so now, the shock and awe value of it is completely gone. Yeah. So yeah. then, if your story's not there to to kind of keep me entertained, then I'm probably not going to want to watch it. Yeah. Uh, I agree. You know, it's, it's, you know, unfortunate for the Saw franchise that it, it made money every year. That's a crazy thing. I mean, it was making millions. So, I mean, they're kind of stupid not to keep the ball rolling there and, and well, going, think, you I know. Think people wanted that rush again of what they felt at, after watching the first one. Yeah. I mean, I think that's why I watched the second one and the third one and any of the other ones after that was, I don't know if I was necessarily expecting to be entertained the same way, but I was hoping that I would be. Yeah. Um, and I just think, like, it's not to say that I'm a diehard fan, but I just know what I felt when I watched the first one. And I just, I wanted to feel that again in a horror film. So mm-hmm. I'm watching it and then I'm being, you know, kind of let down from it. But it yeah. is what it is. Oh, I know what you mean. I, I think I stopped after four or five. I'm just like, at this point, I can't, <laughs> I just can't tell them apart anymore. You know, it seems like it's the same thing. And I don't, I, I don't know. So, you know, it just wasn't it was- doing it for me. Yeah, I did watch the last one because it was shot here in Toronto, and mm. I wanted to see if there was anybody that I knew that was. Oh, <laughs> that there was, you go. Yeah. And um, I actually found myself laughing. <laughs> um, I just, and it, it was just the 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 stunt, like these these things that were happening to these people, like these horrific events, were just almost laughable. Oh yeah. And mm. and I mean, just they look so fake and not real. I just yeah. I didn't buy it. 
I didn't buy it. I don't know if the production value went way, way down on those projects. Yeah. I'm talking trash about it. I know that this franchise <laughs> made tons of money. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, in all honesty, I, I don't know what happened. What happened? Different writers? I have no idea. Yeah, I think so. I think it just kept switching hands a little bit, you know, as they kept going. And, you know, and it's the it's a lot kind of, of diminishing returns when it comes to sequels. You know, you're you're as you go, it's going to make less and less. So I think the budget starts shrinking a little bit more and more. So they got to stretch things a little bit and get some different people in there. So yeah, yeah I think that's maybe that that's what happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a bummer. You know, something else that's making a lot of money right now is found footage films. Um, you know, the Paranormal Activity. You know, we're set to have a fourth one of those. Um, so many, I mean, just clones and, um, yeah. what do you think about those? Are you into the, that kind of stuff? Um, part of me is intrigued as a viewer. Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of like conspiracy theories. Yeah. You always want to hear a little whisper of it and then it's up to you to decide whether or not you can believe this, if it's right. bullshit. Right. Um, and again, I think it's part of that, like, you know, are ghosts real? And, and, you know, have you ever seen one? And I mean, I don't know if you've ever been in a circle of people where you just start telling ghost stories. Oh, yeah. Some of them sound like, I mean, some of them are like bone chilling and you get goosebumps. And then yeah. I think that's what people want. People want that that feeling to happen and they're willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And then I just, I think the found footage stuff is kind of too, they're hits, they're either they're hits or they're misses, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's no middle of the road. There's no found footage film that you come out of saying, yeah, that was that was okay, you know? That was, I think you're either yeah. going to think that it was crap or it was really great and it yeah. scared the shit out of you. Right. right. Um, I, I haven't had the opportunity to um, be cast in one of those myself. Um, we'll see what happens in the future. But... Um, is VHS one of those found footage films? I think so. You know, I don't actually know a lot about it. I know I've been hearing a lot about it. Uh, here, it's actually pretty awesome. Um, but uh, I'm not sure, uh, to be honest okay. with you. <laughs> I, just I feel I kind would... of bummed. You know, I'm, I'm doing a horror show here, and I, I, I <laughs> live horror, but I don't know about that one. So, <laughs> oh, no, that's that's cool. But, uh, no, I mean, there's just so much out there. Um, and people still keep making it, still keep making it. And I don't know, you know, maybe it's, you know, it's a cheaper sort of movie to make yeah um, i was just going to say that i think you can kind of reduce your budget a little bit and yeah. and you know kind of you i think the, probably the one thing that bothers me the most about found footage films is the clarity of what you're seeing yeah oh <laughs> god man it really bugs my eyes out to watch something and i can't i can't really see what i'm seeing like the footage is grainy, and I mean, I guess that's the whole point of it, but I just, yeah. um, I don't know, like, I can't see it, so I don't know if I can really say that it's, like, I believe in what I'm seeing, because I can't see it. Um, mm. You know, a, a movie, actually, that, that sort of um, did it a different way, um, in that it was supposed to be shot on VHS in, like, the late 80s, but yeah. you're watching it, and it's it's obviously shot on film it's hd you know it's actually crystal clear but they they sell it for some reason um paranormal activity three um oh i haven't seen that yet i've seen it two x up oh, actually three is uh, probably my favorite um oh yeah of the three yeah yeah it's it's really really good um okay. but yeah it's this it's this wedding videographer guy you know in the late 80s who just has all these vhs cameras and you know vhs quality you know it's crap um yeah. but uh, this film is, is crystal clear. It's beautiful. Um, and that's one of the things I'm like, you know, talking about this movie when I reviewed it on the show. And I'm like, this is the best looking VHS I've ever seen in my life. Oh, my God. I don't remember <laughs> looking this good. But for some reason, it works. Um, and, and you're sold on it. So, you know, that's that's something second? to be said. Better than the second Paranormal uh, Oh, yeah. The second one was my least favorite. Um, I like the first one. The first one definitely gave yeah. me the creeps. Yeah. Um, again, I don't know if it was because it was kind of like the first of its kind in terms of yeah. that space, but the first one definitely gave me the chills and the creeps, and I did not like being home by myself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. the second, the second one, I wasn't as impressed. I felt like they were kind of trying too hard to to tell the story yeah. um, and to have things happen as yeah. opposed to them just unfolding. Yeah, yeah. Three, so I think you would be. I'll watch, the th I'll watch the third one on your recommendation. Yeah, yeah. Let me know what you think. That's, uh, yeah. I think you will like it. So, okay. 
But, uh, well, this is really cool. Uh, Sandra, thank you uh, for, again, joining me tonight and everything. I think, uh, again, if you haven't seen Pan's Labyrinth, everyone out there, I think, needs to see it. Uh, horror fans and, uh, you know, anybody who really enjoys fantasy, a great, great uh, drama, uh, a lot of history in there. Like you said, the Spanish Civil War, uh, I think that's portrayed very accurately. What little, oh, what am I saying? I don't even know much about the Spanish Civil War, but... <laughs> I think they did a good job selling me on I think it. They did a good job too. I'm sold yeah. on it. Yeah, yeah, and um, no, but uh, I think something for everybody. Of course, Del Toro is a master of the craft, and uh, he just has a hard time really screwing anything up. It's uh, you know he's got the Midas touch. Um, I got the fingers crossed for him. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but this was a lot of fun. Uh, of course, we're going to be keeping up with you, uh, your projects, and uh, as things come out. And I, like I said, let's keep in touch and. Uh, let me know when things are happening. I'll definitely be talking about them on the show, and I just can't wait to see you on the screen and see what you can do. And uh, let's uh, let's definitely do this again soon. So uh, you have a website, all these links and everything. So those will be up. And um, okay. any uh, parting words here before we call it a night? I just want to say thanks, man, for having me on the Electric Chair Show. Oh, absolutely. It's been a lot of fun. So, Sandra, it's been fun. Have a great night. Okay, you too. Thanks a lot, Corey. All right. See ya.